Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. How are you doing, Brother Muhammad? Um, so uh, I have a special guest. Uh, me and Brother Muhammad have become close friends, uh, I think, in the last, what, six months? True. And uh, assalamu rahmatullah. Our meeting, I think, began because of uh, Hani Etchen, thanks to him. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Uh, Dr. Hani Achan was the reason that uh, I think um, we got together. And then we found out that we also share uh, common teachers or common, like, you can say, spiritual uh, leadership or lineage. Um, you were also a student of Dr. Asra Ahmed. In a sense, you studied under his uh, son. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure thing, uh, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakat. First of all, thank you very much, Sheikh, for uh, saying that we have become close friends. Inshallah, this friendship is for Allah and His Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And I pray that uh, it cements even more in the coming days. You're very right. We, uh, you actually uh, sought me out on one of my videos, and you said that I did well while talking about Dr. Hani Etchen, and I was flattered. I said, thank you very much. And that's how we began correspondence, and we found out that, yeah, we share a lot more. Uh, Dr. Israr Ahmed Saab, I'm actually a student of Dr. Israr Ahmed Saab himself and Sir Akif Saeed both. I studied under Sir Just Akif Just so everybody Saeed. knows, everybody usually knows Dr. Israr Ahmed If you don't, you should get to know that person. <laughs> and uh, uh, Akif Saeed was the uh, son of Dr. Israr Ahmed <laughs> and, uh, and so I'll just introduce it that way for now. Yeah. Right. So um, I studied Muntakhab Nisab. Some of I took some of the lectures of Muntakhab Nisab from Dr. Isra Ahmad. I uh, and still let me also remember introduce that in, because the American audience doesn't know or the Western audience doesn't know. Muntakhab Nisab was the first course that you know. There's Muntakhab Nisab too, also, but yes. that's within Tanzim. Um, so Muntakhab Nisab one, you can say, is a Quranic course of that's specifically looking at the Quran from the perspective, what does Quran want me to do? Like, what is guidance, right? What is guidance? And the seed of that is Sutul Asr, right? Which gives you the lowest level of guidance and then builds upon that. This is a long discussion, but it's a beautiful, beautiful course. Hundreds of people, uh, hundreds of people went from the U.S. to study this course and benefited because you have to learn the Arabic language, get to know the Quran. It's almost equal to two juz. It's almost one and a half juz worth of Quranic uh, study, meaning directly. Standard. And then, of course, those verses then attach to other verses of the Quran. And so, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. And it is highly recommended if you want to get an introduction to the Quran. Personally, I feel this is one of the best things that you can start with. One of the best things, hands yeah, it down. Is. It is. Uh, it also fits into the divisions of Quran given by Shaulullah Muhaddas Delvi. He gave seven divisions. One of them, so one is Sharia, right? The do's and the don'ts. That's not what this deals with. This deals with what does a believer do, like uh, like Sutan Asr, for example, Sutan Mu'minun, for example, Sutan Furqan, for example, like this. So, what what is the what are the qualities of a believer? And so this like really focuses on that. And what are the obligations of a Muslim at different levels, individually, collectively, and so on and so forth? Absolutely, and, I still right. remember. I think uh, that course uh, really just gave me a certain I don't know advantage because I was 13, 14 when I was studying Muntab Nisab. Can you imagine? Incidentally, Sheikh, I was around that age as well. It is back in 91, I think, 1991 or 92. I think I was 13 or 14 years of age. Wow, mashallah. <laughs> Subhanallah. <coughs> so, and, yeah. You go ahead. I still remember uh, the first time I listened to Dr. Saab explaining, uh, Inna ladina qalu rabbuna allahu. 
ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكه الا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وابشروا بالجنه the first time he explained this i was blown away cuz at that point in time sheikh i was looking for uh something intellectually and um let's just put it this way scientifically provable in islam to hold to hold mm. on to so this was probably one of my anchorages uh at that point in time in life that bi idnillah allah taala ke rahmo karam se which saved me actually which became my savior the way the muntakhab nisab is formed with surah al asr surah al ikhlas other short surahs and then these ayat taken out from different uh, maqamat and then explained in a certain way like you said uh, what should a believer do what is a believer first of all what should one believe in it was so beautifully put and the way dr saab delivered lectures on it like on istiqama i was blown away and it was I, it was awe inspiring really hmm yeah mashallah and then what did you, you studied philosophy with akif right uh, uh, yes I, yes i studied philosophy under akif said saab uh, i still remember that was uh, uh, the textbook punjab textbook of philosophy uh, for the intermediate that we started with and then i took some <coughs> lectures i think five or seven or so yes and uh just as a side point i don't know if the discussion will go there but for people that listen to dr hani etchen and his some of his misguided or not some but a lot of his misguided ideas it's important to know about you that you are an expert when it comes to literature right and you're an expert when it comes to locution and language this is like your expertise and so i want to background is in people to your um channel um let me see if i can do this i recommend everyone uh, subscribe to this because it's really worth it i mean the content here is uh underestimated in my opinion so um jazakallah shaykh still learning really... about still learning about eschatology for those of you who listen to me but a lot of his chronic <laughs> stuff is just on par okay and uh so anyway that's just a side point so so that's just so that if people hear something from you and they're like wait you know um but anyway so yes i don't know i don't know much about eschatology i'm i'm learning about it and really sheikh is responsible for my interest in this field i was never really interested in in the field of eschatology but uh, i really know nothing about it but sheikh you're too generous you're too kind i'm really a jahil i really know nothing it's just you know whatever <laughs> comes to mind i make a video or two and that's really about it no not no i mean his arabic is re- he's an expert in uh, i mean i i'd say pretty close to an expert uh, is from from certain perspectives of the arabic language which i'll tell you why he's an expert in a second um one of the things that impressed me about you from the very beginning was how well you spoke arabic like not just arabic classical arabic but you knew arabic in amia you know also the street language arabic which has a certain advantage when if you only know classical then many times when you only know classical you know of the language but you don't know the language meaning those of us who study fusha and and speak in fusha uh we're aware of the grammar we're aware of the language we are, but then there it's different to be able to actually speak it i think you were born and raised in arabia i was i was uh, both of my parents were doctors allah yarhamhuma uh my father used to work in tabuk then he got married to my mother we moved to baba that is where i was born then we shortly afterwards we moved to al bada that is where i spent the first 8 or 9 years of my life so i was really bred and buttered in amia as it were <laughs> yeah i was um, in the mam for about 4 years maybe mashallah i was studying in minaret al sharqiya i don't know if you heard of the school no uh, i haven't but you were also at azhar sheikh right that's later in life yeah. so this is right, like right. when i was just very young this is before dr sir ahmed rahmatullah alay this is this is my dad had gotten a job in saudia 
so I was, I had, you know, that part of my life was also in, so I know the, I knew the Arab world and the Arab culture. Yeah. And so, and you know, the locution of both Saudi and uh, Masar. Yeah, well, big, yeah. <laughs> big difference, big difference. <coughs> yeah. So yes, like in so, Masar, like in Masar, if we were like together, I would have asked you Zayak instead yeah, of Kifhalik. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, anyway, so moving on. So uh, by the way, my family is partly Egyptian. My wife's side oh, is. Oh, mashallah. Yeah, mashallah, mashallah. Yeah. So, which family does uh, do they belong to? Which Masri family? They're called Uthmani. Uthmani, right. Because I know a couple of uh, lineages from Masr. They were like close uh, to our family when we were back in Saudi. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, let me tell you something funny. Uh, one of my mother's colleagues, she was called Zamzam. Her name was Zamzam. Mm -hmm. So we used to call her Auntie Zamzam. You know, mm -hmm. in Urdu, you'd say Auntie. In, in Arabic, you'd say Abla. Abla Zamzam. Baji, you know, you say you yeah, call Abla, Baji and Abla. Also used, I think, in Turkish for yes. like Baji or Apa. Apa, yeah. So we used to call her Abla uh, Zamzam. And her son had a Namar, a, uh, a female uh, tigress, Namra, a mm. cub. Mm. When they went back to Masr, they left it with us. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> so, so suddenly one day I woke up and I was very young and I heard these muffled crows and I went outside and there was this, you know, baby tigress there. And so, yeah, that was funny, really. We couldn't really take care of it much. So we had to give it to somebody else. But that is one of the fondest memories I have of my childhood. Wow. Not a lot of people can say they grew up with a tiger. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay, so this, I'm introducing this to emphasize that you're, mashallah, a very special person, but you're also in a perfect place to talk about Dr. Hani Achin. And, uh, and you've been really like, I mean, guys, this brother has been studying this person, okay? I think at one point he told me, I listened to him continuously, I forget what you said, but it was like you almost listened to the whole everything he had to say, right? And of course, in one hour, we can't dissect everything he has to say. But I really do see the problem of Dr. Hani Etchen from two perspectives. Number one, the perspective of the Quran, the, the false claim of we are the people of Quran. And this, Dr. Hani Etchen is one of its, uh, you can say offshoots, right? One of its manifestations, which is a direct result of this modern age. So that's one aspect I, I want you to talk about. The other aspect is this kind of like, I guess there's this feeling in people that become religious and become more knowledgeable, or they feel like they figured out something other people haven't figured out. They have this kind of like Mahdi complex, right? And uh, they think that they're going to come and the, they're going to change. They're going to speak the truth and change the world. And I've seen this increase over time, meaning these types of people, there's uh, quite a few of them. I don't want to popularize those other ones that are not popular, but Dr. Hani Etchen, for some reason, was not popular and then became popular and then amazed some people. And it's strange because, wallahi, there are like, I know one brother. I know one brother who was a Christian, became Muslim, and he used to say, you see, I, I knew the Quran, I knew the Bible, I'm a continuation of that. And now he listens to Dr. Hani Etchen, who completely denies anything from the Bible, right? So he was actually more on the Quranic point in the beginning, because the Quran also confirms parts of the Bible, that there's some truth there, it doesn't completely deny it. And uh, so now they completely deny, you know, we don't want anything to have with Israeliyat. It's all the Jewish influence on the Muslims. And somehow Muslims didn't at that time figure it out. Okay. So anyway, that's, that's my introduction. I want you to take it from here, inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.
first of all, Sheikh, you're too kind. Really, I am really Ajhalu Jahileen. I know nothing. I have never made a claim that I'm an alim or anything. Um, yes, but my academic expertise is in literature. I have an MPhil in literature and English, and I'm pursuing my PhD for quite some while now in literature and English. So you're very right. Um, about Dr. Hani Achen, first of all, the Qur'ani yin. I personally feel, Sheikh, that it began as a genuine reaction towards absolutism. As you know, um, and just by the way, I don't adhere to any firqa. I don't believe, uh, belong to any maslak. I identify with the denomination of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. But if you go into the Masalik, if you go into the firqa of Diobandiya or Barelviya or Wahhabiya, especially in my subcontinent, you have something uh, that you can pretty much label as absolutism. Absolutism of hadith, even though certain hadith are da'if. And you know this better than me, Sheikh. We have talked about this. Uh, absolutism of tradition. If something is said by a certain ulama, the others, the ones who come after them, they are going to follow it one way or the other. They're not going to question Keji Hamare. Asad Sameh say in our um, ancestral teachers, Scholar. yeah. scholars, this was said or that was said, why? Or why was it said? What is the dalil? What is the nas of the Quran or the hadith that they basically, no. They said it, it's in so and so book. So we're going to follow it one way or the other. So traditional absolutism, then worship of people, and Sheikh, you will you know this better than me, that really in these masalik, men are worshipped. Men are worshipped because a certain status is sometimes allocated to somebody. Multiple factors, multiple factors. We're not going to go into why this is so, but it is assigned to certain people and then they are worshipped. Whatever they say, whatever they do, everyone will follow from that firqa. So... I have in the past, Sheikh, talked to some Quranis. One of my classmates back in Masters was a Qurani. She was a <coughs> Qurani. And I had a long talk with her. That was the time, actually, that I looked into Ramdi Sahab. Because mm. Ramdi Sahab has done a, a very thorough refutation of Ulam Ahmad Parvez. So I started reading Ulam Ahmad Parvez. I started reading uh, Ramdi Sahab. By the way, started... just uh, for the people that don't know Urdu and don't know this history, this particular history. Uh, Ghulam Ahmed Parvez actually introduced some of the ideas in the way that Dr. Hani is doing in a much better way. Yes, In a much absolutely. more intellectual way. Meaning he was a lot more intellectual than Dr. Hani. Dr. Hani, you can poke a lot of holes in what he says. Because anyway, that I'm just saying that. Ghulam Ahmad Parvez's Lugat al-Quran has been translated into English. His exegesis has been translated into English. His dictionary of Quranic lexicon has been translated into English. Okay. And you can see that some of the things that Dr. Hani Achen has come up with, Ghulam Ahmad Parvez has actually dealt with in a much, much, much better way. Much better way. For example, the concept of Adam alayhi salam, he says that Adam alayhi salam is not name of a person. It is a metaphor for humankind. And he's dealt with this in a much better way than Arsh. It is common between him and Dr. Hani Achen that they both take Arsh as uh, not being something physical, but as Allah's hukm or his knowledge. So this has been dealt with by Ghulam Ahmad Pruiz in a much better way. Anyways, uh, I was just giving a little background to uh, what I thought the Quranian are, what I think where they're coming from, at least the earlier Quranis. Mm. In my region, I believe this started with Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. Mm. And Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan was a thorough scholar. He was not a scholar in, in our cultural sense where, uh, Sheikh, if you give me two minutes, I want to just uh, very quickly comment on one thing here. In my region, unfortunately, and this, uh, Sheikh, you must have experienced as well, 
the ulama the so called ulama have never adhered to the western or international standards of academia mm. so the books that you pick up and read they are not written in any academic format following cms or mla or any certain kind of a format they don't have footnotes they don't have direct references to where they're quoting from a lot of these books you pick up by our ulama just they are just writing like a story book Hmm. and you don't find any of these references sir sayed ahmed khan was not a guy like that he had a university he knew the western academia he knew the international standards of uh, journal publications and what not if you pick up his book you see the scholar the kind of scholarship the guy brings and so i personally think you know he sold everything he had to write that one book in reply in response you know that right in response to uh, this one guy who wrote a very slandering book against our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so his niya was right i have never doubt, doubted his niya and i feel that he genuinely reacted to this sort of absolutism in our tradition mm-hmm. this is how it started this uh, this girl that i'm talking about the quraniya she became a quraniya after she read the hadith of ummina zainab bint jahash alayha salam mm. now you know this tradition right sheikh mm. in this tradition it is often misinterpreted that our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw the wife of his uh, his is a uh, uh, legal son zaid ibn harith and in his heart he felt the kinds of sexual and uh, let's just say it would be a blasphemy to actually go into that and use that kind of terminology so i'm treading with uh, with care but he felt something for her he wanted to marry her and so his uh, legal son divorced her he married her and then made up the verses of the quran about uh this whole thing that allah is telling me to marry her and what not this is the way this whole issue has been distorted by the mustashriqin by the orientalists and when you read this hadith if you haven't read it from somebody who could explain it to you who can tell you the nuances and whatever is involved in it you'd feel yaar this is you know this is too much for me to take i can't take this so i'll reject the canon of hadith this was the reason behind her rejecting the canon of hadith and becoming a quraniya and saying that only quran exists i'm only going to go towards the quran that's it so i i'm sure remember- a lot of these qurani youths they all have stories like this usually reading something in the hadith literature that they find very problematic and which our scholars also many times find very problematic you know so but yeah. we re- uh, w- anyways please continue but i i just wanted <laughs> to highlight that it's it's good that you're highlighting the fact that sh- there was this person that had a story right yes it is a certain incident and then there's no one to really guide these people after they fall into this crisis yes and i just wanted to highlight her <laughs> honesty her honesty her sheer honesty because she was my classmate we were on a very frank terms frank basis so when i indulged with her you know other people were thinking ke yaar bachchi phasa raha hai i'll be very when i used to talk to her others would see oh this guy is trying to you know <laughs> whatever but i used to spend hours with her ke yaar this is not this way this is this way and we don't take daif a hadith you know uh, there is a, a complete science of ilmul usul al hadith in which there are categories and sub categories of the hadith then there is this scientific branch of knowledge known as ilm asma ur rijal and there are books and books written about this so we do asnad criticism we do matan criticism and only after that we take a hadith like we have talked about the hadith of the age of ummina aisha sheikh so yes. it is only after a lot and lot of academic deliberation that a hadith is taken and alhamdulillah this is what i wanted to highlight here that alhamdulillah after a year and a half she actually reverted to be, to being a sunni mm-hmm. she actually reverted because i gave her books i in fact took her to qaidazam library and i showed her sirul alam in nubala which is there in 40 volumes 
Mm. I said, this is just one of the books of El Masmao Rejal. Mm. This is just one of the books that tells yes. us yes. who are the people of the Sanat. Yes. And these are 40 volumes. Can you imagine? Can you just imagine that this one book is 40 volumes? So how about the other books? How about Tariq Baghdad? How about uh, Tadrib al Ravi? And so many. Yeah. And then you have the Tariq al Imam Bukhari. Uh, Imam Bukhari. Absolutely. I've counted, so, just so you know, I, because I was one day looking at this from an academic perspective, this whole issue of hadith. At the baseline, there's about 120 sahaba, maximum. And true. at the max, when you re reach the entire edifice of the hadith literature, you're looking at about, majority of it is about 50,000 people. From the, true, from the baseline, Abu Huraira, Aisha, you know, the baseline that starts it. And then the edifice is about... No, it's about knowing about the life uh, uh, and the reliability of 50 and the interaction of 50,000 people. And majority of these are like students of students of students, right? Anyway, so um, I just wanted to make that point because yes. I just found so, that. Yes, Sheikh, absolutely. The point is, it is a very academic subject. It is not the way every layman in, in, in <laughs> our times tries to portray it. Oh, hadith, you just open an app, you look at a hadith and you say, oh, I found something. This has never been told to me, blah, blah, blah. Guys, these are hadith to determine the status of a hadith. It's a, it's a lot of work. It's not like just opening it on your app and reading through it and saying, oh, this is this and this is that. Mm. So Alhamdulillah, she understood it and she came back to uh, the Sunni Islam. Alhamdulillah. Although at that time, at that point in time when she was Qur'ani, she left praying and she left uh, doing her psalm and whatnot. So Alhamdulillah, I was very pleased. Pleased. I haven't had uh, much uh, conversation with her after that. So it's a long time ago, like 1998 or 1999 I'm talking about. But yeah, so Sheikh, I personally feel that this whole thing, this Quranism and rejection of Hadith, this started as an honest endeavor, wallahi, I believe that. Mm -hmm. I personally believe that this started as an honest endeavor on the part of some very honest, very intellectual Muslims who was fed up, who were fed up with the with the negative side of the absolutist culture within our uh, subcontinent, especially, and also in Arab. Also in Arab, if you pick up and read the book Al Quraniun Al Arab, the author makes a claim which is very close to what I'm saying, saying that primarily it started as a reaction towards absolutism. But later on, later on, I think things were added to it. And one of the basic things that I think became what destroyed their honest intellectual endeavor was the idea that if we are go gonna take the Quran alone, then Quran as a text is just as any other literary text. This is something very deep that I'm hinting at. Mm. When you say, for me, it is only the Quran, it is only the Quran that I am going to look at and take from, then the text of the Quran becomes like any other literary text, any other literary text, because now you have taken away the anchorage, now you have taken away the living tradition that the book has, and you are looking at the written words. When you're looking at the written words, Sheikh, then you are going to deconstruct those words. You're going to go into linguistics. You're going to go into lexemes. You're going to go into semiotics and semiology, and you are going to apply all of those studies to take <coughs> the text, right. to understand the text, because then that is the only thing you have. Yeah. And one very important point to note because is you've thrown is, away the historical aspect. Yes, right? you have thrown away everything else. It's like somebody picking up Shakespeare's Hamlet today. For example, I go to the library or I go to Amazon.com, I download Hamlet. Now, does it matter if Hamlet was alive or dead for me? I mean, as an author, he doesn't even matter. It was performed in the Elizabethan era, but does that matter for me today if I'm reading Hamlet? No. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up a dictionary or I'm going to pick up any critic, any Tom, Dick or Harry who's done an 
exegesis of the text and i'm going to try sit down and going to try and make some sense of the text hmm that is how the quraniyin have been dealing with this hmm so when you go to text alone to understand the language the only thing that's available to you is etymology is etymology and jazur what we call a semiotic study in my uh, last video on dr hani h in my final showdown i actually tackled this in detail in some 4 hours and my point there is that he himself dr hani h in he equates the term a uh, parole by ferdinand de sajor who was a structuralist linguist mm -hmm. with his term locution and he says what i mean by locution is what ferdinand de sajor meant by parole mm -hmm. so i do a complete study of structuralism and post structuralism ferdinand mm -hmm. de sajor and jacques derrida both okay, okay. and and show how this is applied to any text and how the dissemination of meanings is actually looked upon by these two traditions if you want i can go into it and present you with a summary if you like sure absolutely yes i'd love that so uh, what is structuralism structuralism actually uh, the classical structuralism it started with the greeks because they believed that the structures inherent in life are what we can look at are the only things available to us that we can look at to reach to a logos to reach to the ultimate truth which is always outside those structures that is why it is called logocentrism the greek philosophy is logocentric why because they believe that logos exists outside the structures and it is only through the study of the structure that we can reach towards a logos hmm. now but this was too haphazard like plato aristotle other uh, menedes other, other other greek philosophers even the ones after them who indulged into this study they did not have any academic discipline per se or terms to go by you were they were like forming these things as they were going along like kantian terms often time you pick up and read the book critique of pure reason and you mm -hmm. feel that the guy is making up terms as he moves along right yeah. so this was then dealt with in a much more systematic way by northrop frye he was the guy who for the first time uh, sat down and said okay i'm going to make the structuralism i'm going to turn structuralism into an academic discipline mm. so he formed the systematic study he wrote a book he said this is how it should be taught to students so what is structuralism modern structuralism the way we understand it modern structuralism sheikh is when you look at the structures and not the real actual meanings of the things for example let's take an example there is this story about a father and a son there is a father there is a son the father loves his son very much one day they both have a fight let's suppose the son wanted to go to a party alone the father was uh, in denying of that <coughs> he denied it they had a fight the son eloped it at night when the father slept the son uh, ran away so while the son was walking along the path there was a ditch but because it was a night time he fell into the ditch he couldn't see it so close to dawn the father woke up he saw there was no son he became worried he got out and as the sun came up and uh threw its rays its its illumination it illuminated the surface he saw the ditch he saw the sun he took him out of the ditch they both you know made up and what not and lived happily ever after so this is a simple story sheikh what a structuralist would say is that it's not important for me who the father was who the son was their particular quarrel their particular life is not important to me what is important is structural there is an exposition so we are introduced to father and son now the first structure is that of the relationship structure mm -hmm. number 1 so if you substitute the father and son with any other species you make them a tiger and her son you make it a hen and her chick no matter what you substituted with the structure would stay intact 
So that would be structure number one. Structure number two then is the conflict. They will both have a fight. Structure number three is elopement, adventure, or what we call rising of action. The sun will uh, run away. Number four, climax. The sun will fall down and the father will come out and look for him. And number five, resolution. If you have these five structures, no matter what the story is about, no matter if it is about human beings or it is about somebody else, the structures are intact. The structures are intact. And so by looking at these structures as a complete structure, you can reach the logos. What would be the logos? The logos would be the morals of the story, importance of familiar relationships, importance of the fatherly love, importance of forgiveness. You know, if you are deriving these kinds of morals from this structure, then you are trying to reach the ultimate truth, right? These would be the ultimate truths outside the structure. Mm -hmm. So, Sheikh, what I have tried to do is try to condense and summarize like 20 years of my endeavors into like five, six minutes. This is what structuralism is. Hmm. Now, Ferdinand de Sachor, he says that you can reach to the structures and importance of structures, meaning in structures through language by breaking the language into lexemes. And each of the lexeme consists, each of the sign consists of a signifier and a signified. Because, Sheikh, it's all a endeavor for meaning, right? We are trying to reach to meanings. So in this structure, how are we going to look at the meanings? We are going to look at the meanings through signs, the written lexemes. And according to the structuralists, Ferdinand de Sajor and, and the like, Northrop Fry as well. There are two sides of the sign. There is a spoken or written symbol, which is associated with an idea. So the written word, the lexeme or the spoken word is called a signifier. Mm. And the idea that it is linked <coughs> to is called a signified. Mm. So Cat, C-A-T, cat, the written lexeme, it is linked with the signified cat, the, the idea of cat. Hmm. And this is what the structuralists say, that this is how you can reach to the meanings. Now, the problem with this is that cat is cat because it, it is not rat or dog. Right, Sheikh? If you are linking a signifier with a signified, then there is definitely an, an inherent difference between the signifieds. Hmm. And it is only through that difference that the meaning is actually mutahakkaq. It actually becomes present in that signified. Hmm. So if I say cat, cat is not rat or bat. Mm. or anything else. It is different from the others. That is why it has the meaning of cat. Mm. So if I go to a dictionary, for example, Sheikh, what would I find? I would find binary um, oppositions and other um, signifiers and signifieds to explain this signifier, mm. right? Like mm. in Arabic, we say, Al-Ashia utso arafu bi azdadiha. Yes. Right. So the problem with this is that it is always the absence of meaning that creates the meaning. Hmm. Cat has the meaning of cat because it is not rat and not bat. Hmm. So that absence creates the meaning of cat. Hmm. This is what Yad Derrida says. He says that the real meaning is not in the sign. It is in the difference of that sign with other signs. Hmm. Interesting. So it is a complex <coughs> philosophical idea. But what I'm trying to explain here is that this is the approach that people like Sam Gerrans, who is another Qurani, and Dr. Hani Achen, they bring to the text of the Quran. So what they say is, they say that we are going to look at signifiers and the signifieds. 
we are going to look at the lexemes we are going to deconstruct the language and we are going to apply the structuralist approach to the text of the quran and going to look at the etymological and semiological studies mm. now al alaili you might have heard this name in fact dr hani achan also makes a reference to him al alaili was the first one i think he was a lebanese scholar who also went to azhar he did a phd from azhar and studied under many eminent um, scholars he was the first one who did this type of study of the mufradat ul quran mm. even in jurjani if you look at jurjani he's also coming from kitab ut tarifat in his kitab ut tarifat he's coming from the tradition and he assigns a meaning to a lexeme after talking about the tradition and how it is traditionally understood or understood in the context alaili was the first person who applied this western theory of semiology of structuralism and post structuralism to the lexemes of the quran themselves so if you pick up his mujam which is unfinished i think he just did a study of alif only you'll find that he takes a word then first of all he gives the bab because every word in arabic comes from a bab first of all he does the study of a bab after that he goes to and obviously you can only reach the bab through the three a uh, root words right three root lexemes mm. so after doing that he goes to all let's say he do he does a sarf us saghir faala yafailu fi'lan fa huwa fa'ilun wa fa'ila yufalu fa'lan fa zaka maf'ulun he does that of the word and then tries to extract the meanings basing his complete study on etymology alone on this tasrif alone Hmm. that because this word is coming from this bab it has this root in it and it is coming from this bab this is why this word means this and cannot mean anything else so when you are going into the structural study sheikh and in my this video that i did this this last one four hour video no, i also don't mind uh, just show everyone where this is for those people that are interested it is uh Let's see. This episode, I, yes, it Dr. is. Dr. Hani Etchen, final showdown begins. Yes. Right. Okay. Let's continue, inshallah. Yes, sir. So, um, this, this, uh, um, I, I also give many examples. For example, in that video, I talk about Ted Hughes. Ted Hughes's poem "Crow and Mama." If we look at Crow and Mama, Sheikh, would you like to just read that poem with with? But you can't find it online. I'm sorry. Okay, let's 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 for a minute, Sheikh, if you can just open, um, if you can just type there, search for, uh, Humpty Dumpty, dialogue with Alice. Okay, let's Humpty, do it. Yeah, Humpty Dumpty's dialogue with Alice. Humpty. that would be h u m t y okay yes h u m p t y humpty dumpty dialogue with alice Did you study this book when you were a child, Sheikh, no. through the looking glass? No. Okay. Oh, I think I remember it. Yeah, I actually do. So, Sheikh, if you scroll down, this is actually a very long um, dialogue between Humpty Dumpty and Alice, and they are in Wonderland, and she's asking him to tell her to explain to her meanings of certain words. So, if if we read from here, for example. Humpty Dumpty says wrong. Humpty Dumpty explained triumphantly, "You never said a word like it. I thought you meant how old are you?" Alice explained, "If I'd meant that, I'd have said it," said Humpty Dumpty. So this goes on, and if you can scroll down just a bit, Sheikh, there is one place where Humpty Dumpty says, "Uh." Yeah, it should be here somewhere. Yes, just a little bit above it. No, uh, uh, yes. Uh, one birthday present. You buy a gift. 
it is here somewhere but maybe somebody you know, some other t- the, the thing uh, humpty dumpty says i whatever comes of out of my mouth whatever word i utter it means what i want it to mean okay that is what humpty dumpty is saying yeah but that's fine people can look at it people can now find it for themselves okay. i've just referred to it so <laughs> humpty, if you read through this dialogue it becomes extremely evident the problems that you would have if you'd only rely on a structuralist approach mm-hmm. sheikh words mean a lot of things based on a lot of factors not just etymology alone mm-hmm. this is shown by yak derida by paul de man by the post structuralist feminists like uh, spivak very famous writer elin sizu in stigmata um, it has it has also been demonstrated by post structuralist psychoanalytics mm. psychology and psychiatry is mm. something you are well read in yeah, yeah. so uh, like people like jacques lacan for example sheikh you must have heard of jacques lacan mm. he is a post structuralist psychoanalytic mm. uh, people like slavo jizek he is currently he's alive and he is uh, a lacanian uh psychoanalyst so this has been shown that there are multiple problems if you just look at the words as signifiers and signified hmm. simply as signs that could be taken apart etymologically and looked up into dictionaries if you are going to look for meanings that way you are going to err there is no way that you are going to reach to the intended meanings through this mm. you will have to look at difference what jacques derrida calls difference which is really a context it is it is let's say like the neuro network the neurons have have network with each other meanings have the same kind of network and between the words the meanings exist in mm. a context mm. this is how the meanings are reached to this now this is approaching dr hani achen from western uh, academia from eastern academia i had already approached this uh, thing and and uh, and i showed in my 5 hour long don't video don't mind interjecting this is so interesting for me because um i'll give the example and i'll say what you're saying in in, in a different uh, same thing from a different perspective uh, once i met a muslim historian very good muslim brother very good muslim he's a professor at temple university um he's done his phd on the abbasid period okay and uh, he said the quran is very anti historical whenever you try to focus into the quran about something specific about history it'll it doesn't give you anything to grab historically so i found that very interesting for many reasons but now let me take his words and apply it like this the quran is very anti structural because for example wailul lil musallin right the quran you can't understand quran only looking at quran unless you have at least some context for example the very beginning just at the very onset looking at quran just as quran that level of divineness transcendence is not clear as much as it is clear with a specific context right it's much more clear with a specific context even though of course quran talks about itself but again that leaves a lot of interpret a lot of open interpretation and it's very interesting because it's like what they did to the bible right with with the with the protestants they say okay let's throw away the the pope in this case absolutely and, you know absolutely. let's throw away the pope let's throw away the entire tradition let's throw away everything the catholic church had to say now let us decide what the bible is saying for us and the result is what you got a billion different interpretations and none of them agree with one another the methodist the lutheran you know the catholics the all the different presbyterian and you just go on the baptist and all these different groups they don't agree with one and this is what you have in the quraniyun because you're opening up you threw away context and now the natural result the inevitable result is now you have to look at it as literature 
Absolutely, absolutely, yes. And and in the, that the inter- specifically, yes, will, now you're making yes. it more interesting is from a structural point of view, right? And yes. so much meaning is lost and and the, added. That- Sh- Sheikh, the the structuralist approach, the three major things that it proposes. One of the fundamental things about structuralist approach is that the author is dead. Unless and until you take and deal with the text in seclusion without looking at it from the overarching cultural inferences, you cannot do a structuralist study. So the first thing that the Quran Yun have to do while exegeting the text of the Quran is to believe that Allah is dead. After uttering these words, after giving his Prophet ﷺ the book, Allah is dead. Why? Because if they believe that Allah is alive, that how can it be, Shaykh, that Allah who is all-knowing, all-present, uh, all-powerful, would leave just a text in the hands of, of people? If Allah is Hayyul Qayyum, it is a direct, Right. If the purpose uh, is guidance, guidance, yeah. That's like that's like giving you a machine, and then giving you a manual and saying, "Figure it out." Right. Absolutely. You're gonna be yes. like, "Well, I figured it out this way, and it didn't work." And the other guy figured it out that way, it didn't work. And we're all trying to figure it out, and no one agrees with one another that if we got it right or wrong. <laughs> Just without with only a manual, you can only go so far. The Quranians, they don't agree with themselves. That's Chef, right. You can see it. Yeah. They don't agree on even a single thing. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, the, the problem is satisfying the mind versus spiritual satisfaction, which you mentioned earlier, right? That the sister, after one and a half years, she, she felt something about, there was some tranquility in being able to pray again, doing fasting again, doing the spiritual uh, regiments that Islam gave again, right? I'm, I'm saying now to the Quraniyun brothers and sisters out there that you might want to consider that in the whole struggle of satisfying your intellect, uh, what you lost as a result of spirituality and the satisfaction of spirituality might be something you might want to consider. Uh, anyway, that's just a side point. But yes, that sister, that Qurani sister, she also reverted back to Sunni Islam because she understood she was a student of literature as well. Now, Sheikh, she was my classmate. Mm. So when we were studying Shakespeare and we were <coughs> studying Edward Bond and we were studying Greek tragedy, she understood that this is the kind of approach that the Quranists are bringing to the text of the Quran as well. Hmm. So the Quran becomes just another, another work of literature, just, just like Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, just like a book of poetry by Ted Hughes or Sylvia Plath. You can pick it up. You're not concerned with the living tradition. You're not concerned with how many lives this book has changed, hmm. with, with the kind of revolutions that this book has brought. And we talked about um, uh, the Tur Ahmad Bassam Asai, the way he tells about the miraculous nature of the language of the Quran itself. Right. In his and book also you Mark. have a series on him too, right? That, that you were doing. I was following that for a while. Let me also... Shea, you must have got bored because it's really nothing very scholarly. No, 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 it's no, just no, a no, frank no, reading. I, bored. I just got behind <laughs> Okay. And so um, where, do you remember what episode? Sheikh, sh- yes, Sheikh, if you go to the top and uh, uh, go to the playlist section, the, there is a playlist. Yes, playlists. Yes, so there is uh, the playlist. Um, Miraculous. Okay, where is it? Miraculous language of the Quran. This is the second one. Yes, yes, Sheikh, this is the one. Okay. So this is the series, right? This is and in this, you're actually going through the book, I think. Yes, al Yes. Yeah. This is, incidentally, this is also a book that is referred to by Dr. Hani Achen, saying that he made use of this book in his own study. <laughs> oh, okay. Which is, which is funny, actually. <laughs> but that's exactly yeah. uh, the, the problem, is that you know everybody takes what they already intended to take. Yeah, that's true. 
That's true. You know. This book is actually about, and, and Dr. Ahmed Bassam Asai does an excellent job of doing a study of the new tharaqib, of the new expressions, of the new lingual constructs that the Quran has brought, which were not known to human beings before the Quran. Hmm. So, for example, saying like saying something like "Wakan Allah Ghafura Rahima." Now, this this word "Khan," the Maad Khan and and the Mudare Yakun. So, the the word "Khana" is for Maadi. Every human being, even today, Sheikh, you've been to Masri, you've been to Saudi. Uh, have you ever heard any single human being <laughs> use use this Khana? The way Allah has used it, no, Subhanallah, no. Subhanallah. Yes, so yes. Uh, when Allah says "Kan wa kan Allahu Ghafur al he means He means Allah was and is the most forgiving, the most merciful. This is the kind of study that the Tour Ahmed Bassam Asai does, and he does an excellent job of showing us the reader the new tarakib. And then one very important chapter in his book Al Maujiza is deals with the with the pictures, with the ideas, the signifieds that the Quran brought. Mm. For example, Sheikh, before the Quran, it was not known to human beings that human be a human being can own time, that a human being or somebody, anyone, can own a yom. Th this concept. This tasawwur was brought by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he said, Maliku yawmiddin, Maliki yawmiddin. He is the owner of the day. Of... Now, what do you own, Sheikh? You and me, we own laptops, we own gadgets, we can own a keyboard, we can own a mouse. But can somebody own a din, a, a, a yawm, um, a day? <coughs> So this is subhanallah, the miracle of the language of the Quran. And he proves it empirically. The, the main thing about this book is, and also, Sheikh, you must have uh, looked at it from this way as well, that it has not found a mainstream following, this book. Hmm. In, in, in Saudi, for example, in Masr, for example, nobody is talking about it. Not many people talk about it. Why? Because it breaks away from the conventions. Mm. It criticizes some of uh, the ideas that was put forward by some of the mutaqaddimi. Mm. So it really breaks away from the tradition. But it empirically, the main thing about the book is about al mujiza is that it empirically, in, in verifiable empirical terms, shows you exactly what is miraculous about the divine language. Mm. And that is something extremely inspirational, at least for me. Mm. Mashallah, mashallah. Okay, so, <coughs> so the so the so the methodology <coughs> used by Dr. Hani is structuralist or uh, Structur the structuralist. Okay, structuralist what else? semiotics. Yes. Now, what else is a problem with this? Uh, the you know, like in terms of riwayat and the qiraat, uh, the denial of the hadith in terms of the. <laughs> Uh, Sheikh, it is actually very funny when you when you say that uh, you're going to deal with the Quran just as a literary text. The first thing is how you are going to authenticate the text. This is my first and simplest question to the Quranis that I meet. And nobody, nobody, I have been asking this question for well over 14, 15 years now. Mm. Nobody has ever been able to come up with an answer. They will always go to other things. They will stoop down to insult, sometimes try to argue, sometimes take the debate away from this and say other things. There's a simple question, Sheikh. Alhamdulillah, in today's time, we have established the text of the Quran as from being the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or from the time of Uthman Radiallahu An. This is Alhamdulillah empirically with us in, in the form of parchments, in the form of, uh, you know, written codexes. And um, Haytham Sidqi has done an excellent uh, study of this in his latest research paper a couple of years ago, the four codices uh, study, the Masahif al-Amsar. Uh, 
Hmm. If you want to search that, uh, Sheikh, the spellings are Haytham, H-Y-T-H-A-M, S-I-D-K-I, Haytham Sidqi. He's done an excellent work on this. And so we have 100% empirical proof that the Quran is as it is in its written form, as it was penned down by Uthman radiallahu an. Hmm. So this is proven, right? But here is the problem. That text that we have is a consonantal skeletal text. Because Arabic is one of the languages which are known as the... Um, <coughs> what are these languages called, Sheikh? Aramaic and Arabic? Medic. Sorry? The Medic. Uh, no, no, uh, Sheikh, the, the, these languages who don't have fixed vowels. Okay. And anyways, they have a name. I'm forgetting the name. So even the Old Testament, which is originally in uh, um, Aramaic, it does not have fixed vowel vocalization. And so its qira'a, uh, its vocalization was fixed and was adopted by a church or was adopted in the in the tradition in the jewish tradition now it is known as tanakh right that is what they read so it is a fixed qira'a of that text arabic in its original form the vowels are not fixed only the consonants are fixed mm. so this text that we have it can be read in any way for example if it is written taha it can also be read as tahi it can also be read as tahu. I mean, my simple question is, Birmingham parchment, yes. So in, in Birmingham Quran manuscript, if we look at the language, in Arabic, these are called Lugatu Samiyah. By the way, just as a side point, <coughs> When the Birmingham uh, parchment was first discovered, it, it contains Sutul Kahaf, Sutul Maryam, Sutul Taha, parts of those. Yes. I went fearfully, went word by word by word by word by word. To, because this is, I think, as close as we can get to the time of the Prophet ﷺ, right? Absolutely. This is believed to have been one, this is believed to be one of the copies of Al-Imam. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, please continue. So if you look I just at, want yes. people to be able to see the fact that this text, in a sense, it can be argued, does not give you the word. The word is given to you by the riwayat. By the qira'ah, absolutely. By the yes. qira'at. And so if Go. you look at it, Shaykh, Go ahead. Yes, it yes. Is, yes, it is written ta and ha. On the left side, Bismillah rahman rahim Taha ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an al-Tashqa. But if you look at the text itself, it is a consonantal skeletal text which, can, which could be read anyway. Even if somebody argues that because of the Arabic grammar, it cannot be read in multiple ways, just two or three ways, I have a simple question for them. What is the meaning of the word Taha? In which grammatical structure does the word Taha falls? Nobody knows the actual meaning of Taha. So can't you read it as Tahi? Can you read it as Tahu? Can you read it as Tiha? <laughs> I mean, Astaghfirullah al I'm not trying to... <laughs> no, actually, you, know, you raised a very good to... point. I mean, <laughs> when Quran starts with letters like Alif Lam Mim. Alif Lam Mim. Right? I Quran mean, who, is telling forcing you? the reader to connect to its context and to the riwayat and to the qiraz by which it is by which it gets meaning right because the skeletal text is just almost like you were saying it's like an ayah it's like a signifier right it's yes, symbolic absolutely. of the word but it is not necessarily the word in a sense i mean it not is the word, word it is yeah, signifying but, that word but yes. you need to really know what is that word? You need the qiraz, you need the riwayat, you need the oral tradition. Because Sheikh, in its actual form, in its asl, 
द कुरान इज ए करा नॉट ए किताब यू इफ यू रिमेंबर द डिस्कशन दैट वी हैड एज वेल बिकॉज अल्लाह bestowed it upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a qira'a as a recitation <coughs> yeah and when it was re- revealed as a recitation the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told jibril alaihi salatu wasallam to go back to allah and bring other recitations of it as well because his umma was not capable of reading it only on the lahja of al quraish that's right right chef yes. that is how that is how sabat ahruf were given to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam now uh, over here just on your wanted, point yes. i want to just mention something to you might find interesting you see how alif lam mim looks like bismillah in some ways There was a professor at Yale University who was theorizing the alif lam mim was actually bismillah okay and it became alif lam mim over time this was his theory okay right right the theory you can it's like a bu- uh, a balloon you can put pinch a, a needle and it'll pop i'm not going into the argument with him i'm simply explaining what you're trying to say that how do we how does if you only look at quran as literature right without the riwayats without the qiraas you'll come up with all sorts of absurd theories right absolutely and, absolutely and and the other thing is is that there's no way to identify how to read this at this point without the qiraas absolutely so, you know some quraniyuns should say we don't read it as alif lam mim but you, you, you see it's so embedded in the culture time and history in the context they can't escape it they can't Absolutely. it's it's Absolutely. inescapable and so qurani yun in that sense is a lie right because every single qurani yun calls alif lam mim alif lam mim in the way we do it in the qira and if you're Absolutely. doing qira it's the it's the riwayat it's the narration this is how it's read it's according to the tajweed rules according to the arabic alphabet you can't escape that yeah. which is what they're trying to escape Yes, it was brought down to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in form of a qira'ah. We have absolutely no idea, Sheikh, what went on between the angel Jibril alaihi salam and our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right? No scholar, nobody on earth today can make a claim that I know exactly how the angel Jibril brought this to the. prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in what way in which way shape, shape or form because in the quran it's also said that it is munazzal ala qalbi muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that it was bestowed upon the qalb the the heart of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we also have jibril alaihi salam saying iqra bismi rabbikal ladhi khalaq so we don't know, know the exact schematics what we do know exactly is how it has been pronounced enunciated and recited by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself and so in the asl in the in the in the principle in in the in in its real form uh sheikh you wanted to say something i did but i wanted you to finish <laughs> okay so in its original form it is a recitation and nabi karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in al qur'an unzila ala sabata ahruf faqra ma tayassara minhu the quran has been revealed in seven ahruf now this word ahruf is from mutashabihat nobody knows exactly what it means but from the context we can derive the idea that it is about the recitational differences so sabata ahruf in faqra ma tayassara minhu read whatever is to your liking and whatever is easier for you so it is not absolutely necessary to recite in all the ahruf or to have preserved all the ahruf um and so yeah so hazrat uthman radiyallahu anhu he actually preserved uh the ahruf that were remained after the arda al akhira the last recitation Uh, which was done between jibril alaihi salam and nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
because the nasb <laughs> happened in there the abrogation happened in there so abrogation was also with the uh, in the uh, in the ayat of the quran as well as its recitation now the point here is like you said sheikh if we don't have these recitations we cannot authenticate the words of the quran mm -hmm. we cannot we have the words of the quran in a, in their written skeletal textual form yes but these words are only authenticated through qiraat if we take one of these qiraat and leave all the other for example when i talk to people like ghamdi sahab etc etc these quran you and they say half sanasim half sanasim half sheikh is weak you know this ibn kharash says that half was kazab kazab yadul hadith he was a liar he used to fabricate hadith yahya ibn ma'in from the tariq of ibn mahzar he says kazab half was kazab half was a liar no matter what you say ghamdi sahab has this uh, quite ridiculous theory i mean uh, with all due respect he has but this is this theory is ridiculous so i have to say it the way i see it that qiraah amma there was this am qiraat the the qiraat that was mutadawal and it was just one qiraah and that has came down to us ge from generation to generation to generation now you can see sheikh how ridiculous this theory is there were multiple recitations and even if you say this is qiraah amma this is one recitation <coughs> that has come down to the us it has the advantage of multiple recitation is that they confirm one another yes that is what i was coming to it has a self test yes. within it yes absolutely so the within the quran is Okay, what are what are the other kiras? There are other kiras that confirm this recitation, and there are other yes. kiras that confirm this recitation. Yes, Sheikh, if we don't have other kiraats, hafs then is weak, and this whole thing falls apart. But because other qura and turuk and raviyin they corroborate the kiraah of hafs, that is how hafs kiraah becomes thika. That is how hafs kiraah becomes authenticated. So, if somebody is going to tell us and say, "Oh, it is kiraa hamma," nevertheless, in empirical terms, because this would be the a very uh, non-educated thing to say, "Oh, it has just come down to us from generation to generation." You'll have to show in empirical terms the chains of narrations, right? So, the chain of narration would nevertheless include hafs. And if you only take hafs and you reject everyone else, then hafs is weak and everything falls apart. For example, Sheikh Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. And I remember when we were having this discussion, you went and you did a study of the Qur'ats, right? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen on N Qiraat, if you look this verse up, everybody reads it like this. All 10 Qura read it like Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So by the collaboration, by the collaboration of the 10 Qura, this becomes mutawatir. If you don't have the 10 Qura together, if you don't have this canon of 10 Qiraat, then <laughs> you know everything falls apart. Yeah, I mean, that's the internal mechanism of verification the Quran has is the different and all of these people that are experts they all have a ijaza and asanid that go back to the Prophet Sallallahu I wish uh, my son was here to show you his ijaza I would just do it just for the purpose of demonstrating but we'll leave that for another time okay he has so, uh, ijaza in Ashara Shaykh no no not in Ashara no no right. but, but inshallah he, he someday, many, inshallah he has, he has in many I think he has a whole bunch of hijaz at, at this point. But anyway, the point I was trying to make is that I think people haven't seen that there is a system of hijaz that goes back to the Prophet. Yes. A sanad you know, this is Islam wants everything to be testified, verified, you know. And so the, the kira that even when uh, Dr. Hani and his likes, they're using a word, okay, this is this word, and let's go to its roots. They're using the help of the Qira to make that statement, right? Because they're making use of that printed version, which has a fixed text. And these texts are fixed according to different rivayat. The tashkil happened according to the rivayat. It was not ijtihad. The tashkil of the Quran, what is tashkil, Sheikh? Tashkil is to display the auditory, right? Yeah. So if I am going to pronounce Alhamdu, the tashkil would be Alif, Maftuh, Lam, 
مسكون حاء مفتوح and so on and so forth so the tashkil happened to uh, happened in accordance with the different riwayat and qiraat for example the fixed text we have today the most commonly printed text is according to the riwayah hafsa nasim and so you are very right the quraniyin 99% of them i think i heard sam jiran's talk about uh, uh, the riwayah of warsh or susi otherwise they, the, these people don't talk about qiraat or riwayat so they are <coughs> making use of hafsa nasim qira yes yeah so in order to be purely quraniyun purely quraniyun without the context of history and riwayat without the context of hadith without the context of anything if you want to start blank uh, blank slate they would have to first print a quran without any dots without any tashkil and mm-hmm. then figure out what the quran is saying at that point on their own Absolutely. but they would also have to prove that that quran that that they have that they're giving meaning to is somehow historically authentic so they want to deny history on the one side that don't give it historical context but on the other side they will say oh this quran is authentic right you can't have both you can't have denial of history and then say quran is authentic denial of uh, and then you're de- uh, you're you're pretending like you're denying the riwayat even though you're borrowing from that so that is a very weak starting point it's a weak starting point because you're standing on the uh, f- from borrowing from that history of those words that are themselves narrated in the hadith literature meaning it's part of the hadith literature of narration and of 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 man saying that this is what this what the prophet meant when he said this verse yes. right and so there's a huge human element in there it's not like the quraniyin make it sound like they have received the revelation directly from allah or that angel jibril has brought them this quran there is a lot of human element involved in all of this yeah and then the other thing that's very interesting allahumma salli ala muhammad which is that that is how they start acting as if revelation did come to them and that they're now going to tell you what the revelation is saying a very you know i don't know if i want to open up this pandora's box but like when they talk about prayer right they say oh quran only mentions three times of prayer not five times of prayer so <clears throat> so they go based upon what their understanding of the ahkam is in the quran or whatever but the point is that your starting point is from borrowing from that hadith and from those narrations and that's a very weak starting point if you're going to be truly qurani absolutely yes absolutely and once they uh, some of the qurani in that i've talked to i mean sheikh one thing i want to say here and i want your uh, listeners and your viewers also to realize this guys not every qurani is like hadi achad okay <laughs> there are actually very polite and pleasant qurani in out there who would talk to you humbly who would say that they are not absolutists that they are only trying to understand like everyone else is and i have actually talked to many humbly uh, many, uh, sorry many humble qurani's as well sheikh not everyone is like hani achad not everyone is i'm sorry but comes across as a megalomaniac <coughs> or a nar- or a narcissist like like dr hani hn i mean i'm not definitely, trying to yeah definitely a narcissist because yes. every time i've tried to talk to him yeah. he deletes the comments he doesn't allow anyone to he no. only wants to see the pretty picture everybody is saying oh wow you're such a great person you oh yeah. wow you're such a great person <laughs> i mean subhanallah i don't even have time to go and look at the comments that i get and i have a lot of comments people write against me i just leave them there yeah right? absolutely and, uh, we 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 never delete comments sheikh you and me we never do that yeah i mean generally i've never do- i've done that maybe in one occasion because it was about the person i was interviewing the brother yeah. i was interviewing yeah. and the person made, and i thought that was out of bounds to say something about negative about the person i'm interviewing so i took that remove by that. the way sheikh if somebody says anything negative about me on <laughs> this video please leave it no problem 
okay. no problem no problem i don't mind you know who will be saying something negative about you <laughs> so anyway yes so the okay so now we talked about the riwayat we talked about structuralism do you want to talk about the bataniya aspect of this yes shit Which i would like to relate to by the way to my brothers and sisters that are quraniyun right i want them to consider this verse of the quran fa in amanu amanu bi mithli ma amantum bi if they believe as you all meaning the companions of the prophet have believed fa in tawallaw fa inna ma hum fi shiqaq if you turn away from this you'll be divided right and that is one of the biggest signs you're not on guidance is that no one agrees with you guidance has to be something that has a jama'a that's why it's called ahl sunnah wal jama'a wal jama'a people yes. of jama'a that we we can come we have a foundation on which we can come together the edifice of quraniyuns is they don't have a foundation within themselves to come upon as a collective or even as a minority because they're divided every quraniyun you talk they have a different they'll agree that we don't agree with hadith literature that's the only it's it's a negative agreement right the neg- the agreement is on something that is not athbat but uh, a nafi a negation which is that okay all hadith literature is bad but when they come to the quran itself which they're saying is authentic they don't agree upon their fiqhi interpretations their their interpretations of the words and so on and so forth anyway that's a side point So the other part I want to emphasize is the the batani aspect and by the way I think I want to share with you because uh I don't there is a part of the Quran that actually talks about this batani kind of interpretation right and what the Quran says about this type of people and you know this verse of the Quran right that what does Quran say about people who try to find interpretations within Quran that are like secrets right like we and if you ever go through for example dr hani's uh uh page right if you go through his page you always find this word like kind of like secret uh secret his, and code the secret code, 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 code or, yeah, lot, yeah you know and uh, let me see if i can get this uh how do you spell marvelous mar m a r v e l o u s right so i'm not going to play any of his uh videos but i'm going to show you if you go you know to his if you look at you know what is that right uh, three yeah. secrets from the story of yusuf right this yes. kind of like the did muhammad meet jibril okay Salam what Allah. who and why you know all these like questions of secrets right um three secrets four secrets, secrets. supplication right uh, and 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 discovery the the word he you yeah makes use of abundantly is discovery the new discovery yeah uh and so so everybody can go through this uh, page of his and and kind of get that idea and now with that if you're sincere and really believe in quran well i'm going to let brother muhammad explain the batiniyun and how it relates to this particular verse of quran that's an indication of if somebody's on the truth or not uh before coming into this for your viewers guys one thing i want to tell you here when you are listening to sheikh pay attention to something pay attention to how humble and how accessible he is this is really one of the major attributes one of the central attributes of somebody truly knowledgeable truly knowledgeable with my interaction with sheikh i have found him to be extremely humble the teachers even my teachers that i assign the highest form of adab to are always the people who have always said that we don't know anything who have always been humble in saying that we are just searching for truth like the others are we don't really know anything and i just wanted to uh, you know make this point sheikh i'm not trying to you know uh, flatter you or anything this is honestly i mean for i i want your viewers to pay attention to this very important factor somebody who says i'm the absolute i'm sitting here on this babylonian throne so to speak in my ivory tower 
above and beyond the others. Nobody else can touch me. Nobody else has understood it the way I have. You know, that should be the first red flag for you. Sheikh, am I mistaken in saying that? No, no, you're absolutely right. Uh... That should be a huge red flag. When somebody says, you know, <coughs> I have, I am the one, you know, I'm the only one who has understood it. Or you feel when he's telling you something that he has that kind of rauna, that kind of ana, that kind of narcissism in his approach, that should be the first red flag. So this ayah, this verse of the Quran, Allah says, Huwa alladhi anzala alayka al-kitab. O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's the one who has revealed to you this book. Minhu ayatun muhkamat hunna ummul kitab. There are definitive verses, verses which cannot be interpreted in any other way. And hunna ummul kitab, they are the foundation of this book. They are the foundation of the belief system that this book proposes, that this book brings. mutashabihat, And there are other verses which are not that apparent, meaning of which is not very apparent. And those who have a marad, in, in their in their kulub, those whose uh, hearts are not pure, fayat tabiuna, they always go towards ma tashabaha minhu. They will always go towards the verses which are not very clear. The meaning of which verses. And what Dr. Hani is doing is he's taking he's taking the muhkamat and making them mutashabihat. Mutashabihat. وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ They will try ابْتِغَاءُ الْفِتْنَ ابْتِغَاءُ تَأْوِيلِهِ They will try to uh, do an, an interpretive exegesis of it. In fact, nobody else knows about the truest meanings of these verses but Allah Himself. And وَالْرَاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ Now this ayah can be interpreted in two ways. And uh, the mutaqaddimin, mufassirin have interpreted in, in, in two ways. The first is, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَالْرَاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ That nobody knows its ta'wil, nobody knows its inter interpretation, but Allah <coughs> and, and the one who are rasikhin fi al-ilm, who are, uh, let's say, firmly rooted in, in the in the right kind of knowledge in the right kind of kind of ilm. And the other exegesis is Wama Yalamu Ta'wilahu illallah and nobody knows the interpretation of this verse. Stop, full stop. And the ones who are deep rooted in the right kind of knowledge, they say we believe in all of it. All of it all of this is from my Lord. وَمَا يَذَّكَّرُوا إِلَّا أُلُوا الْأَلْبَابِ And only the wise are capable of taking zikr from it, taking the nasiha from it. So uh, this is the verse that uh, Sheikh wanted me to uh, put in front of you. And he's very right. Basically, he, Hani Achen is taking this concept and applying it to the whole of the Quran, that all of the Quran is mutashabih, all, all of the Quran is difficult to interpret. Nobody knows the ta'wil, the interpretation of, of the verses, but a shaykh ad daktur Hani Achen, <laughs> Hani Achan. That is what he is saying. And Batiniya, this is actually Muslim tarikh. Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, tells us in his Muqaddimah that this started with Shia. The, and, and, and he also alludes to uh, Al-Milal wa Nihal, which is a book that outlines the firaq of the Shia in detail. But really, the, the, the Tafsir al-Batiniyyah, it started with uh, Ismailiyyah who were the first um, Rafidi firqa of the Shiites. Even the mainstream Shia today, they don't consider them Muslims. Ulat and, 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 uh, and, and uh, Ismailiya and Qaramtiya, all of these, they were really uh, non-Muslim people because they invented, and, and Sheikh uh, 
ابن تیمیہ سیز یختعون فی الدلیل والمدلول سو وٹ وی ٹاکڈ اباؤٹ دا اسٹرکچرلسٹ اپروچ یو نو ہی از سینگ آلموسٹ دا سیم تھنگ دا دلیل والمدلول دا سگنیفائر اینڈ دا سگنیفائڈ what they do is the the batini what they do is they displace the signifier and the signify yakhtauna fi dalili wal madrul so they do a structuralist approach by deconstructionism and they displace the signifier and the signified for example uh, where allah says an tazbahu baqara they say that the baqara here means amma aisha radiyallahu anha astaghfirullah al azim aur tabbat yada bi lahab wa tab they said that by yada it is meant abu bakr and umar radiyallahu anhuma astaghfirullah al azim so this is how they invented the batni tafsir in modern times there is this book by uh, one of the major jurists ismaili jurists which lays down the uh, rules and regulations for doing tafsir batni and the first rule in there is that the quran has one apparent meaning and every ayah of the quran can go up to 70 70 secretive meanings and the apparent meaning the meaning that is apparent through the context is not important the real meaning of the ayah is what is contained within in the deeper layers this is the usool of the batni tafsir now there is a tafsir ishari sheikh which is done by the sufia but that is a different thing because that tafsir the first rule of doing tafsir ishari by sufia is that the apparent the apparent contextual meaning can never be left mm. can never be left you can go towards <laughs> other meanings but once you leave the apparent the apparent contextual meaning then obviously what you are indulging into can never be right can can you know if you are taking okay sheikh do you know something interesting the first time i heard uh, hani atshan uh, it was his hoor video hoor my okay. student sent it to me cuz i had made a video on hoor before that and so one of my students he sent me the video and said uh, uh, sir listen to this as well so i listened to it the first time i listened to this interpretation i'll tell you honestly sheikh i said subhanallah mm-hmm. this could be one of the interpretations right mm. if he is interpreting that hoor maqsurat un fil qiyam means that there are scriptural verses of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are protected in layers and layers of meanings then subhanallah why not sheikh that could be one of the interpretations why not mm. right This yeah, yeah. Is what I and it also connects with Surah Rahman because over there uh, in Surah Al Waqiah, right? لا يمسوا إلا المطهرون إلا إلا المطهرون. Referring to the Quran. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because these two surahs are a pair, yes. according yes. according to Mona Farahi's thought. Okay. Yes, I, so, I I know I know you are. So لا يمسوا إلا المطهرون. So when I heard that, and that was also one of the first videos I saw, I was like, okay, he's right in some ways, but. in but in the way that he's wrong he's leading people astray uh, that was my first so over there sur rahman you have la you must uh, la, you know uh, you have sur al waqiya you have sur al waqiya is la yumsu al mutahharun and sur rahman is uh, uh, hur maqsurat fil khiyam lam yatamashunna insu wa la jan min qabl wa la jan yes yes so i I, i connected i saw okay he's he is by mistake onto something in some cases which is not helpful to the person who's not a scholar but because you know he's going into the the etymology of the word and that will help the scholar but only if it's congru- it's if it's rooted on true knowledge to begin with yes okay. the first red flag is, red flag is that you have inconsistency in the context because if you're saying hur always means scriptural verses then how about gilman what would gilman mean then are you trying to say that the verses of the quran have two sexes like there some of the verses of the quran are, are male and some of the verses of the quran and female there are multiple problems with this approach yes, yes, but i'm 
but like you're saying this was my first introduction to uh dr hani achan so when i first And, heard him i was also like impressed but yes. when i saw after like a few videos i was like oh no this does not work <laughs> and sheikh i'll tell you wallahi billahi uqsimu billahi alazim wallahi billahi thumma tallahi the way <laughs> the way masri says as well i was confused for a lengthy period of time i didn't know what to make of dr hani achan because at the same time he was appearing to me like someone who is honestly trying to unravel the textual meanings right mm. and then i was confused oh wait a minute he's also saying that you can take the hadith just for tarikh so is he a munkirul hadith is he not a munkirul hadith why is he rejecting all the tradition what is he trying to do and then when i looked at the complete body of his work this is what you also referred to as my saying that i continuously you know i put on his video in my office whenever i found time came back home put on his video on my laptop continued from there on my bed on my cell phone mm. i i did that for at least a couple of weeks you know <coughs> he has hours hours and hours of videos and when i looked into that then I, okay he's a qurani then i understood then i understood the tradition that he was coming from and the dire mistakes he has made like saying for example isa al salam was a mushrik yeah i mean if that is not kufr if people still don't understand that how kufriya this aqida is in the name of jesus was basically somebody do, he was doing shirk yeah so three big mistakes structuralism pretending that you're divorced from history when you're not in the riwayat and then thinking that you're finding secrets in Quran that no one else has figured out tafsir batni yes those are academically now we're not even talking about attitude or anything right so just academically these are three very very problematic uh, aspects of dr hani achan and then therefore many of the qurani yuns that uh, that they have in terms of their uh, their interpretation or their um Do you know sheikh yeah. most of the quraniyin they also have another very major problem that of the flat earth oh uh, okay yes yes because if you're doing an etymological study a structuralist study you can't interpret those verses any other way yes tahaha so, tahaha yes. when you say tahaha what is the meaning the etymological meaning what is what does that mean when you're already at the edge it just continues so yeah, that exactly. you know you know and anyway you you're right so the problem of the qurani yun is it will lead you to a flat earth theory it would lead you to a flat earth theory it will also lead you to dire mistakes in interpreting the biological verses the, the verses that de- deal with biology in the quran for example the verses the the um um the chain of verses in surah mu'minun about uh, the conceiving of uh, human uh, nutfa how would you interpret that as a qurani because then you're talking about leech the words would mean not how it appears to be but then the words would mean etymologically what they mean in the dictionary oh that's so interesting because you know one of my sheikhs he wrote a book on uh he was trying he was one of my sheikhs ahmed mustafa one of the uh, teachers i learned from he wrote a book actually on islam and embryology and he right. came up with one rule in one of his books he said that when quran talks about what we call science quran is doing exactly what they say which is to uh, to describe the observable right uh so the quran describes it like as a chewed meat right mudgha yes Yes. So is it really chewed meat? Is it is it chewed meat? I mean, is what would the Quran meat? say here? <laughs> you know, is it really chewed meat, or is Quran describing what is observable? The same problem happens in Surah Al-Kahf when it says, uh, "When the sun is going down and it looks like it's setting into the sea, in the uh, murky waters." Yeah. In the murky waters, does it really mean that it was setting into the murky waters? Right. Oh, it appears to be so. Yeah. Right. So it's the observable. that the quran is describing and he was saying that that's very miraculous because then you know quran is appealing to the 
to the imperialist, uh, the empirist, the one who's observing the world. Observing, yes. And, and Quran is describing data, things, yes. you know, فَلَا يَنْدُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبِلِ كَيْفَ right? So that's kind of like, do you not see? So Quran is describing exactly what you would see. Anyway, Absolutely. I thought that was... Absolutely. But yeah. if Quran is doing that, describing what you see, describing it, then then the Quraniyun would get confused in those verses of the Quran. Absolutely. Like you said, mudgha. What is the etymological meaning of mudgha? Yeah, exactly. That would be <laughs> going all sorts of directions. I don't think a Quraniyun so, would want to do that. So it would become it would become very funny very quickly. Very quickly. And it would become extremely funny. Because yes, you absolutely. would have to take this mudgha in the way that we are translating it. Yes. So... You know, I was giving that example where you have a machine and only a manual. But now when we go back, we have a machine we don't know how to use. We have a manual that has letters without any vowels, right? Just the, the, just uh, a, a manual with only vowels. And everyone's reading the manual differently, okay? And they're all trying to discover and, and, and they're all trying to not understand what is the what does this machine do for us? They're trying to now, their attitudes become, okay, what's the secret button? What's the secret, you know, what's the, what's the secret thing here? And, and so this is really the example of the Qur'an Iyun. They, have, they really have a manual they don't even know how to read. Absolutely. Without Absolutely. borrowing from history and the riwayat and from the narrations. And this is why Hani Etchen uh, says this uh, explicit <laughs> In explicit terms on his website, he says that I do not reject all hadith, but I take the hadith for its historical significance. And so you understand that he will have to make use of certain hadith to explain certain historical phenomenon in, in the Quran. Mm -hmm. And so he's very cunning and intelligent when it comes to that. He has left himself that space with, mm -hmm. within which he can walk then. Mm -hmm. SubhanAllah. So, yeah. at the end of the day, uh, Shaykh, the Quran again, now at, at, at the level that they are today, they are definitely, definitely pretty far away from the Islam, from Islam and its spirit. I mean, that is something I hope we can agree on, right? Yeah, absolutely, yes. It's, it's a very, but it's also what I'm seeing is that more and more people, more and more Muslims are gravitating towards this type of Islam because it is also easy, Sheikh. When uh, you become a Qurani, you don't really need to pray anymore. You don't have you to don't feel bad pray. about anything, right? You don't have to yeah, feel about absolutely. I've missed my prayers. You don't have to feel about I've no missed problem. my fasting. You can give interpretation however you like, and you can intellectually keep justifying anything to outer space. No and Hajj, no Zakat. Even Zakat, this is just Quran is only talking about purification of heart. It's yes. not talking about the real money. There's no discipline. There's no feeling bad. Everything can be justified. And that's it. It's, I mean, what's left? So it's really easy. I mean, I understand some of these youngsters who uh, blatantly try and grab on to Quranism and then try to justify it in all means, by all means possible. I do understand because then it gives them freedom. All day, just sit around, man, do nothing. Just listen to Hani Etchen saying a couple of things. Just read the Quran once in a while. And that's pretty much it. Right. And it, all it is, it's just, uh, you know, uh, there's a mob mentality that when you hear a mob leader say what you you stand for, and then you just feel good. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yes. So that cult like, status, yeah. That cult, right? So it's kind of like you hear Hani Etchen. Wow. He said such beautiful things, <laughs> right? Like that must be the right way. That must be it. Right. You just verify. And this one of the things is that people first thought when the Internet will be here, people hear diverse views. It's not. Everyone likes to listen to who they listen to. And they actually become more polarized from the opposition because they're only listening to that one point of view, you know, rather than the other point of view. And this is the problem within the Muslim in general, is that if you're a Salafi, you only listen to Salafis. If you're Sufi, you only listen to the Sufis. If you're, you know, whatever group you belong to, you only listen to them. And then you're, you're not in a position to build bridges. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree to you, Sheikh. I 100% agree. Yes. And so the same thing with the Qurani Yun. If they're not going to listen, if they're only going to listen to Qurani Yuns, 
right? They're just going to feel better. And, but if they don't listen to the, they'll never be able to really challenge themselves, right? And so that's the, but yeah, liberalism and the way the world is going with liberalism, Qur'ani Yun makes sense to a lot of the young youth because they can then justify a lot of things, unfortunately. Absolutely, yes, yes. And, and, and one of the main things that the Qur'anism does is, especially started with people like Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, Yudip Yuskel does it, uh, uh, people like Rashad Khalifa, one of uh, Sheikh, the major things is about liberalism and rationality, the Mu'tazila fikr, mm. that you try to explain everything according to a rationale to the Western intellect. You you try to tell them, oh, jinn is nothing. No, 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 don't, don't be confused. In the Quran, jinn does not mean another species. Allah is just saying that there are people who are very... Uh, uh, quickly enraged so allah calls them jinn they are the jinn or malaika that's just a metaphor <coughs> yeah. or how the world works or jannah yeah. is the ideal society and jahannam is the opposite of that so i that read somewhere where much... sir saint ahmed khan said malaika are forces of nature in this yes. that's what he called, called something like the, that. The, the physical laws the rules of physics are called malaika by, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's actually some, it's what you're saying, Sheikh, is very true, is very true. It is because some of our youth has been exposed to the Western intellect and because they are not well read, they are not thiqah in their tafaqqah of deen, they, 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 are, they don't have that depth in the knowledge, they haven't, they are not well read. They, whenever somebody says something from the Western uh, intellectual uh, paradigm, they are so afraid and they look for, you know, refuge like, oh my God, Dawkins say this. So Islam is all nullified. Islam is no more. Oh my God, what am I going to do? Or this guy has said this, so what am I going to do? Islam is, a, is, is not a religion, Sheikh, that can be, you know, uh, Allah says in the Quran that they want to, uh, blow away this candle be right. him yeah. by yeah, blowing right. at it. Their words. It, it, yeah. Their words. It's not yeah. a candle, Sheikh. I mean, it's a powerful. <laughs> we have an intellectual tradition. It's not like somebody, <coughs> Tom, Dick, and Harry. Somebody like Dawkins once come comes up and and says something about uh, religion, and the religion will be no more. It's not like that. But the youth of today they go towards rationalism and go towards Mu'tazili fikr and the rational fikr and the rational thought and try to rationalize everything because I think this is one of the factors because they want to align it with the Western intellect. Yeah, so one thing is very clear, right? Qur'ani Yun works well with liberalism. For example, you take the story of Lut alayhi salatu wasalam. Now you can make it into any story you want. You can make it into... Absolutely. You know, the problem of the people of Lut is not explicitly stated. And so there, I've seen authors justify and say, well, was, you know, this is, it, it's not that they were doing this. Like, for example, uh, there's one author that's become pretty famous here in the US. And he's a progressive Muslim. And, uh, you know, he's, he was saying that it wasn't the homosexuality that was the problem, it was the fact that they were stealing on the roads or that they were doing things openly okay so this is like kind of like how you the thing is is that there's a story you can twist it into whatever you like right and and without the context of the tradition without the context of the narrations without the islamic uh ethics and the ethos the historical ethos you're just gonna it's gonna completely fit into the western model Absolutely. And, and that's what people ultimately want. I mean, and if they sit down and talk to themselves, what is really my problem with the tradition? And I'll mention here this. I mentioned this a lot of times, but I think it's a good point to mention this. Modernity is defined by denial of tradition. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is being skeptical about that's when you're modern. You're not modern when you carry an iPad. Okay. You're not modern even when you drink alcohol. That's liberalism. Right from a philosophical point of view, you don't become liberal because uh, 
you, I mean, liberalism is nothing new in that sense. In a sense, it's drinking alcohol, dating, marriage, uh, having intimacy without marriage, and so on and so forth. What is unique about modernity, it is the skepticism of everything from the past. So what they want is they want a Quran like as if it came down today. And then they want to interpret it in the way that they would like according to the norms of today. Based upon the philosophical foundations of the West, which is basically, you know, empiricism, believing that only that is true, which can be uh, known by the five senses. Okay. And so anything that is not verifiable and traditional is suspect, right? So you can't have Oliya Allah that did miracles, right? That's just stories. And of course, we can go into Ghuluv in that. But complete denial of that is being modern. Yeah, exactly. Yes. You know, so anyway, the... No, Sheikh, any, this is any last words? Very Sheikh, this is actually extremely important. What you said is extremely, extremely important. And people need to realize this because this also ties in with the eschatology. This is also one of uh, the nishani, one, one of the uh, signs of the Qiyamah, if I'm not mistaken, Sheikh. <laughs> I haven't read that much about eschatology, but I know a little bit. And so this is one, one of the things that people will try to get rid of what, whatever anchorage they had or yes. something along those lines. Yes, of course, of course. They'll so, change the name of the wine. They'll change the name absolutely. of adultery. This is the Hadith, right? Yes, and then, absolutely. And people also amongst the signs of the Day of Judgment is people say, well, we don't find it in Quran. We don't need to do this. This is amongst the signs of the Day of Judgment. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is actually something really important. <laughs> Any last words, uh, Sheikh? Inshallah, we'll meet today, uh, again. So hopefully these are not last words. And Sheikh, I just want to say that it was extremely enjoyable. And I'm not saying it I'm not saying it just by the way of saying it. Really, this was very enjoyable for me. This was e extremely delicious in terms of, you know, academic flavor. flavor. So <laughs> inshallah. It is always, inshallah. Inshallah. So, uh, Sheikh, I want to do this regularly with you and want to talk about a lot of things, especially uh, what we were talking about in our messages, in our back and forth. Yeah, yeah, there we are some, yeah, inshallah. There are some things that I want to bring to my locale, to my milieu some of the things that my youth and we will talk in urdu inshallah so those people can a lot of people can benefit inshallah from my region my students in fact and they don't understand this this uh, this whole concept of khilafa of caliphate and how every muslim should strive and struggle for it mm -hmm. instead of saying that uh, democracy is the way to go or uh, capitalism is the way to go and my youth the privileged class, the, the students who have access to excellent education, <laughs> even they don't understand what Khilafah is and why a Muslim should pursue that. So definitely I'll be seeking you out because you're my big brother and I have found a big brother in you and, and a good friend, alhamdulillah, an excellent friend, inshallah. So I will, inshallah, seek you out and I will make you give me more time, inshallah. But thank inshallah. you very much. Jazakallah wa ahsan jaza fiddarain, inshallah. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Okay, wassalat wassalam ala Sayyidina Mursaleen Muhammadin al-Ameen. Okay, assalamu alaikum everyone.